Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Lincoln Journal Star's Life in the Red podcast. Luke Mullen and Amy Just, your usual co-hosts. And it's uh, it's been another another week of quarterback discussion, mm-hmm. of a little bit of doom and gloom. Um, Just a little? <laughs> well, Optimist. It's, actually, it's, it's a pretty nice day out, even if it is cloudy today. But Almost a record high, yeah, I think. Indeed. It's uh, 75, according to my watch. Definitely. It's unseasonably I'll, warm. Let's get out of here. Let's go enjoy the day. <laughs> what are we doing here? Um, but, I mean, you know, three straight losses, the, mm-hmm. the quarterback situation going on, and a very three tough games ahead, mm-hmm. um, all kind of contributing to the storm that Nebraska football is going through right now. And we'll get into all that in a second. Uh, but a lot of other Husker sports going on mm-hmm. um, today in particular. National Signing Day for most sports, softball, soccer, uh, basketball, all sorts of things. Volleyball, baseball. Um, yep, for sure. And so just to, wanted to highlight highlight two very quick. Of course, volleyball, um, a historic recruiting class. Not necessarily historic because they're number one in the nation. Nebraska's already done that. Uh, but signing five top 15 recruits, mm-hmm. super impressive. Uh, just quickly to run them off for you. Outside hitter Harper Murray, she's the number two recruit in the entire nation. Setter Bergen Riley, she's number four. Defensive specialist Laney Choboy, she's number five. Right side Caroline Yervicious, she's number seven. And middle blocker Andy Jackson, number 13, overall recruit in the nation. Great job by John Cook, huh? Oh, my God, yeah. I mean, it's just like Ohio State in football. It's yeah. just like, okay, they lose really great guys. They had two first-round draft picks who were receivers last year and yet they just keep reloading and that's just basically what nebraska volleyball is doing it's uh, it's amazing i mean they can they can basically start a a whole starting lineup from this recruiting class yeah basically um and i i believe we'd have to get our our brent wagner in for the official um confirmation on it but i believe becca alec uh, was part of a team usa volleyball team with four four of these five recruits i think um, so already a lot of chemistry um, going into this program. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Flip and Choboy late in the process as well from Minnesota to Nebraska. Big win Huge on win. that one. Huge win, definitely. Um, and also briefly wanted to touch on baseball. Uh, Huskers are signing a 10-player class that includes three Nebraskans. Um, having covered high school baseball in the state, very familiar with all three of these players. Uh, two pitchers, I think, that can do a great job. Ryan Harahill from Elkhorn North was a state champion last year. Um, just fantastic stuff. I think he he might need a year maybe to adjust to college baseball, get a little bit of a relief role going on early. Uh, but Tucker Timmerman from Beatrice, I think he'll be able to to step in pretty much right away. A guy who just dominated Class B, I think gave up about one or two earned runs in, in 30, 40 innings pitched last year. Super impressive. And then right here from in Lincoln, Max Butenbach, Lincoln Southeast outfielder. He'll be signing with the Huskers. He's been committed since sophomore and it was as a sophomore uh, that his head coach said he's got just as sweet of a swing as, uh, as Alex Gordon, former Southeast Knight himself. So pretty high praise uh, for Butenbach right there. Yeah, go Knights. <laughs> proud, proud Southeast alum right here. Southeast shout out on the pod today. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, so, you know, important things going on for all those teams, uh, women's basketball and men's basketball teams also signing a lot smaller recruiting classes today mm-hmm. um, in the portal era. Things are things are a lot different, obviously, in all those sports. But basketball, that was one of the considerations. But, hey, we're into the season now. We are, yeah. So I uh, was at both games at PBA yeah. on Monday. That was Monday. Yeah, I don't know what day it is anymore. <laughs> um, and the uh, Nebraska women, they're ranked number 22 in the country. So you knew they were going to come out and dominate UNO. And they did. They won 136, including making 14, 14 three-pointers and not attempting a single free throw. Strangest box score I've ever seen in my entire life. And then in the evening, um, the men played Maine, and they rolled out to a pretty big lead, uh, but Maine, um, early in the second half, just could not miss any shots. Got it down to one point, but Nebraska pulled it out and won 79-66. And the men play again tomorrow, and the women play again on Friday. Yeah, and as you wrote in your uh, your column the other day, it's it's crossover season, football, it is. volleyball, all the basketballs um, going on, a lot a lot happening with Husker athletics. Mm-hmm. Um, but want to get back to the football side of things, yes. obviously. Um, 
you know, we'll, we'll talk pretty briefly about this Minnesota game. Um, great start. I mean, it was, looking back at it now, it's kind of like, how did they manage to produce that, you know, knowing that they were going to fall flat on their face uh, the rest of the game? And the reason is great scripted opening drives. They, they do a good job with that. Too bad you can't script an entire game. <laughs> a good point. A good point indeed. That was a joke for those who thought I was serious. Um, but yeah, no, it just that first drive is just perfect. And then they got away from what what yeah. from what was working, um, but and then didn't make the necessary adjustments to Minnesota's adjustments. Absolutely. I mean, Anthony Grant doing a great job early mm -hmm. in the game. Um, I think Minnesota managed to bottle him up a little bit more. But you look at the way that this offense trended, and I mean, they ran him six times on that opening drive. I mean, he he had what like three carries the entire third quarter. I mean, it was a a very big departure from the type of running we saw in that first drive, and it's led to a little bit of a back and forth this week. You know, Mickey Joseph saying we need to be happy with these three four yard runs, need to play Big Ten football. Um, but unfortunately for them, the opponent they got coming up is. Uh, they don't allow a lot of three, four yard runs, more like one and two against against Michigan. Yeah, yeah. Last week, uh, Anthony Grant had 60 yards rushing on the first drive, finished the game with 115. So there you go. Absolutely. But I mean, honestly, this this Nebraska defense, I mean, that first half was great. As good of a performance as they've had all year. Yes. And then I don't fault them. I don't. Yeah. Because what are you supposed to do when your offense has six consecutive series where they are on the field for three plays. What are you supposed to do? I mean, it. yeah, I mean, it, it takes a toll on them. I mean, you're thinking about, obviously, I mean, they rotate players and to, to limit how tired you are, but, you know, when, when the offense is only taking up a minute, a minute and a half, you know, with these quick three and outs, it that stuff adds up really quick. Yeah, and, you know, it got away from Nebraska, and... You can't, you can't do that and expect to win. Like this is the, this is the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. Like a ten point lead, is normally safe against Minnesota, but this Nebraska t team isn't a normal team. Yeah. Well, talking about that ten point lead, um, wanted to bring something up real quick. Get your opinion on it. Caleb Tanner after the game, Nebraska senior leader, one of those guys on defense. He said Nebraska got too comfortable being up 10-0. He said Minnesota outplayed them in the second half, which is definitely true. Do you buy it that Nebraska was getting comfortable with a 10-point lead? I just think that Caleb was pissed. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the sticking point that he went to. I just think he was frustrated because he, like everybody else on that team, are competitors and they want mm -hmm. to win. And you get frustrated. And what's he going to do, blame the offense? Like, no, he's not going to do that. Like, no one's going to do that. But we can do that. We can do yeah. that. <laughs> we can blame the offense, but um, yeah. it'd be a really bad look um, if a, someone on the team was blaming yeah. the other side of the ball. It's just, it's just hard for me to imagine that a game of that nature in which, yes, they were up 10, but they weren't really dominating or even controlling the game, obviously, there mm -hmm. late in the second quarter. Um, just hard for me to, to feel that they would be comfortable in that. Even if they're excited to have a lead, I mean, they – they got to know that there was still a lot of work to be done. Um, in the third quarter in particular, had that all come crashing down. Uh, Minnesota outgained Nebraska 217-14 to 14 in that quarter. And, of course, the, uh, Minnesota's own backup quarterback, uh, Athen Kaliamakis, he, uh, he brought something different to that Minnesota offense, started throwing it a little bit more than they did when Tanner Morgan was in the game. Um, so four different quarterbacks played and uh, just a wild, wild situation all around. You are leaving out that Anthony Grant took a direct snap. That's true. Grant, Grant for QB. <laughs> we never, we never know what's going to happen. No, but we don't. I'd like to see more of that. Honestly. Yeah. Just but, anything. Just right. anything. Try something new. See if it works. Because they don't have much of a prayer this week. Anyway, still back to Minnesota. But yeah, let's let's get into the quarterback <laughs> rotation. You know, a little bit during that game, and a little bit with an eye ahead to this upcoming game against Michigan, you know, obviously it seems like Purdy was the guy chosen because he fits the offense better for what Mark Whipple wants to run. They had confidence in him as a passer. 
Uh, but we, you know, we saw kind of the script early in the game, running the ball, those quick passes, screens, as you've been calling for on this pod those for screens. quite a while. Uh, you know, the, the type of things you want to do for a passer who you might not be, you know, comfortable throwing, mm -hmm. you know, timing routes, all these these challenging throws into the middle of a defense. Um, but after all those three and outs, you know, it was clear he, he didn't have that same efficiency he did early in the contest. Mm -hmm. Why turn to Smothers for one series, backed up, and then go right back to Purdy for the next two? That was like the nature of my entire postgame column. Yeah. Was basically the question. Absolutely. It doesn't make any sense. Like, if it's not working, try something else. Like, giving Smothers one series there, that didn't do anything. And then you yank him, put him back on the sideline. Okay, what's that do for his confidence? What's that do for his rhythm, you know, as a passer? There, there is yeah. none. There is none. And so, I mean, give him give him two, three. And then if things don't go according to plan, okay, fine. Put Purdy back in. But, like, you, you got to give him more than three plays, right? Yeah. I don't know. And he, I mean, he he made the most of his his opportunity there late in the game. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that people would necessarily say Smothers was perfect. I mean, obviously nope. that that missed opportunity to run at the end of the game mm -hmm. that loomed very large. Had a couple of throws that I'm sure he would want back to be a little bit more accurate with them. But I think it is kind of interesting that Chuba Purdy played the vast majority of this game, but yet Smothers only completed one less pass and nearly doubled his passing total. And just two drives there at the end. Yeah, and, you know, it should be said that some of Purdy's passes were dropped. True. Yep, very true. But also, that's not the entire uh, picture being painted there either. Not a great day. Yep. Well, put it in the past, and now it's on to Michigan, and we're still having this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, Casey Thompson's health still, still very much in question, not really practicing, not – Still not being able to, you know, grip a football, which is kind of important for a quarterback. Yeah, it's uh, you should probably uh, have a baseline of being able to do that before you should be allowed on a football field yep. again. But what do I know? I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Sounding like the Nebraska coaching staff up here. Um, but, <laughs> but anyway, I mean, the writing on the wall is that even though they say he's day to day, even though they say that they're not going to rule him out, it's it's going to be Chubba Purdy and Logan Smothers again this week in all likelihood against. Michigan and so the top the number three team in yep. the country and so the question is you know what are these guys showing in practice versus what are they showing in the games that's been discussed a little bit this week uh, Mickey Joseph saying Logan Smothers needed to show more in practice Mark Whipple on the other hand saying that Logan Smothers had his best week of practice this week um, maybe both things can be true also yep also possible I mean uh, how much I mean in all like honesty though like how much is was he practicing before because you practice your starter yep. for most of practice and then your number two guy gets the reps and that's chuba so how much has he been practicing so of course it's probably going to be his best week of practice considering he hasn't probably had a whole lot of first team reps since camp ended so whatever yeah it just those two not being on the same page is getting a little infuriating. Definitely, definitely. And with a decision this big, I mean, you, you'd really want them to at least be on the same page publicly. I mean, they can have whatever disagreements yeah, of or course. whatever. But it, it, it is interesting to hear um, their comments not necessarily being the same. Yeah, and it, sometimes it feels like, no, they're not on the same page, but sometimes they're not even in the same chapter. Yeah. Or the same book. <laughs> like it's just like what okay it I don't want to get going on a rant here um because we need to move on but <laughs> it's just you can think what you want behind closed doors and you can have your arguments and disagreements um because that's where some of the best decisions come from right like if it's all group think all the time then maybe you're not making the best mm -hmm. decisions but you should probably be on the same page uh in public but definitely well what they are on the same page about is that it's going to be really tough uh, to go up against this Michigan team with the backup quarterback. And whoever plays, um, it'll be another top five defense uh, that they're going up against. 12.1 points allowed per game. That's third nationally. And you have the situation with, again, backup, inexperienced quarterback. And you think, okay, you know, lean on the run game. 
while Michigan number one nationally um, in run defense, 72.4 rushing yards allowed per game. Um, a couple other quick stats. They've recorded 29 sacks this year, forced 11 turnovers, um, so over one turnover per game. I don't know what the math is on those sacks. Two and a half sacks per game. Ish. Uh, so a defense that, that does it all and does it all well. Fun. <laughs> and then on the other side of the ball, uh, they also have a top 10 scoring offense, um, which is also incredible. Quarterback J.J. McCarthy, been very good for this team this year. Um, not necessarily asked to play hero ball. He doesn't need to. Just be efficient, and he's done that, completing 70% of his passes, 12 touchdowns, two interceptions. And then, of course, we've heard about it all week, uh, these running backs. Of mm -hmm. course, Blake Corum, one of those guys so who's, good. who's looking like he could be a Heisman Trophy front runner. Then the backup, Donovan Edwards. Is also very good. Yeah, I mean, he could, he could be a starter on pretty much anybody across the whole country, and he still gets, he still gets his touches. He still gets uh, his role in that Michigan offense, doing it really well. Yeah, and back to Corum for a second. Um, Harbaugh said earlier this week that Corum is, like, the best, like, running back that he's ever coached or something to that, like, yep. extent. He's coached a lot of really talented guys. Well, he, he compared him to, to Toby Gerhardt. Which is yeah. insane. Like, Nebraska has its hands full this week. Without a doubt. And wanted to, <laughs> wanted to quickly mention um, their top wide receiver, Ronnie Bell, uh, a guy who's been at Michigan for a while. Mm -hmm. and I think he has a, a very interesting college career. Um, played in every game as a freshman. Had a big, had a big uh, sophomore season. Did all right during the COVID year in 2020. Last year, caught one pass uh, in that Week One game. 76-yard mm -hmm. touchdown play, big time play. Tore his ACL after that. Had to come back uh, this season, and he, he's done. He's done very well this season. Uh, but to me, the the really interesting statistic. He's 124 catches for 1,900 yards as a Wolverine, but hasn't caught more than two touchdown passes in a season. And that came as a freshman when he only had eight catches. Um, so he, he's been eating up the yards for this Michigan team, eating up the targets as well, but hasn't necessarily translated touchdowns because they got these bruisers who they could just trot out there and just say, hey, run that thing in, score us another touchdown. If it works, it works. Absolutely. Well, we'll we'll get to our predictions here in a minute. Uh, spoiler: not too optimistic. Um, Shocking. But before I know. we get into that, it is our Husker hot topic, mm -hmm. our weekly discussion. And last week was about the quarterbacks. It's the hot topic again this week. And we were talking about it a little bit earlier. But I'll pose you the question: Does Casey Thompson play again this season? <sighs> By the sounds of it, he wants to. He may be one of the most competitive athletes I've ever been around and I've been around a lot like he's up there I'm not saying he's number one I think Michael Thomas is number one um, but he's in the discussion of like the top five that I've been around so like I, I understand that he wants to get back out there um, but man there's no shame in shutting it down yeah like there are three games left and if you're not playing this week okay then there's two games left why rush it? Why force it? Like, there's no shame in shutting it down. Dude's been bruised, banged up, nicked up all year, and now you're actually dealing with another super serious injury. Like, if he, if his hand, pinky, nerves aren't 100%, just shut it down. But, look, I get it. Like, if he wants to play and he's capable of playing, he will play. Um, but... I don't know what the risk is trotting him out there for one, two more games. Yeah. I mean, what's what's the upside? Maybe maybe Nebraska gets a win, um, but ultimately, especially if he doesn't play in this one, I mean, bull hopes are going to be long gone, which they already basically are at yeah. this point. Um, just a, a mathematical formality. Um, but so, I mean, I don't think there's a whole ton of upside in rushing him back out there. And the other big consideration is if you want him back for next year, just rest him. I mean, I think that's a, a case where, I mean, he, he's going to have a, a decision to make either way about Portal, retiring, NFL, Nebraska. I mean, there's just, there's so many factors for Casey uh, to consider this offseason, uh, but his health needs to be the biggest one. And, and like you said, I mean, nerve damage is, it's a huge deal. And it, it's going to be a type of thing where, I mean, I, I can't imagine, I mean, how is he eating, going about his daily activities? I mean, if you can't 
grip of football. You're not going to be able to do a lot of act other activities as well. Uh, but all of this is to say that I think, yes, there's a very good chance that he does end up playing again this year uh, because, like you said, he is such a great competitor. And I think, you know, ultimately we don't know without asking him why he wants to be out there so much. But I think he, he probably feels a little bit of a responsibility to his teammates, uh, especially those guys on offense that, I mean, you know, he's been working with all throughout, you know, spring and fall, you know, getting ready. You only get so many chances to actually get out there on a Saturday and play. Um, it's something that they work toward all season. So my assumption would be that that he does feel like he's got to make the most of those chances, you know, play for his teammates, you know, back them up. But ultimately that it's a big it's a big decision and it could have uh, some very big health impacts. Yeah. And like, look, like, do I think he'll probably play if he's healthy enough to? I think he will. But I just don't understand without talking to him. Yeah. Why he wants to be out there so bad, other than the fact that he is just a major competitor um, and won't go down without a fight. Absolutely. Even if it's a, a losing fight, he might want to be out there. So good teammate. Um, wish him the best of his recovery. And yeah, well, we will see if Casey Thompson plays again for Nebraska this season. But one thing we do anticipate, he won't be out there on Saturday in all likelihood, um, which makes an already tough challenge for Nebraska that much tougher. Uh, we've been following the line a little bit, which... Is that over 30 now? It What's is. It, it is. So a preview of my mailbag for anybody who reads that. Um, 30 and a half points right now. Depending on the sports book, it's still 28 yeah. and some, 29 and others. Um, but 30.5 in another one. Um, I'd imagine this is the biggest underdog Nebraska has ever been. Um, the data doesn't go back that far to say for certain. Mm -hmm. um, but... It's definitely the biggest underdog they've been since 1985. And um, the only other 30-point underdog that they were was against Oklahoma in 2004. Um, OU went on to win that one 30-3. Uh, to three. Um, And then a couple other really big uh, lines as well there. Um, this is not the biggest spread of a team that I've covered before. You wanna you wanna guess what that is? Oh boy! Looking at my it's, computer, it's gotta it's gotta be the Jayhawks, right? Of course, it's the 2015 <laughs> Kansas team, the worst team in modern college football history. Yes, but what do you think the line was Ooh. for against number two TCU? Ooh, 40, 40 points. Forty six and a half. Forty six and a half. The Baylor game that year Yikes. was a forty six point favorite. Oklahoma was a 39-point favorite. Oklahoma State was a 33-and-a-half-point favorite. Texas Tech was a 33-point favorite. West Virginia was a 30-point favorite. That season sucked. <laughs> so uh, so take take some comfort, Oscar fans, in knowing <laughs> that, that it's not... That season was hell. It's not quite 2015 Kansas level of misery. Hey, it, it, even though it's a 30-and-a-half-point line, it is not the biggest line this week. Also it's true. only the yeah. third. Only the third. You could be Indiana and be a 40 and a half point underdog to Ohio State. Or you could be Colorado. And no one wants to be Colorado. They're a 34 and a half point underdog to USC this week. So it could always be worse. It could always be worse. Yeah. Well, and it, it but might, I'm not predicting yeah. a very good. It uh, might end up being worse it might, than the line I don't on think, Saturday. I don't think Nebraska covers. Well, what, what are you going with then? 66 to 14. Yikes. <laughs> Why 66? I mean, that's a lot. It is a lot. Um, and I think most of those points will come in the first half. Mm -hmm. I think M Michigan will have a very easy time against Nebraska's defense. But also, in this era of just four teams in the college football playoff, like, there can be no doubt. Um, and so for the best possible seeding um, – I mean, the college football playoff basically wants teams to go out there and never give up, even when you're playing a team that you are a 30-and-a-half point favorite over. So, I mean, you look at what the committee said about TCU so far and that, oh, they've gotten down in some games. Mm -hmm. And so you see that, and you're like, oh, okay. Well, every team is going to have to just – put the pedal to the metal the entire time, and I think that may be what happens. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If they if they trail even once, I mean, wheel them out right now. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah, that's just why I think it's going to be pretty ugly is just because Michigan, you know, yes, they'll have to, you know, there's still other games down the road for them, but, like, you have to 
prove that you belong by just beating up, being the bully to teams that you are mm -hmm. so much better than. And that's why I think it's going to be pretty ugly. Fair enough. I'm, uh, I'm also projecting a, a lopsided loss, but not quite as bad. Maybe, uh, maybe I should uh, reconsider that right now. I'm going with 45-10 uh, for Michigan, which I do think that that number could go way up. Um, depending on how fast they pile those points on. Uh, because I think back to last time Nebraska played in Ann Arbor, the 2018 game uh, was a 56-10 final there uh, that Michigan beat Nebraska by. And this game was just over. I mean, it, it could have been over in the first quarter. It was definitely over at halftime. Michigan led that 39-0 at half. Um, and something similar could happen um, because – you know, how much clock is Nebraska going to be able to chew up? I mean, how well are they going to be able to avoid turnovers? I mean, these are all things where you turn the ball over early or those three and out issues come back up and, and Michigan can easily run away with a, a few quick, uh, maybe not quick, I mean, turn the clock on those, some of those drives, but a few touchdowns early and, and they'll really get rolling. Or, you know, is there a pick six or two or a fumble recovery or something that could just blow the doors off of this pretty early? Anything is possible. Um, I just hope that if it gets really ugly really early that Joseph and Harbaugh agree to a running clock at halftime. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. Well, it's happened before. <laughs> Not for Nebraska. I, yeah. don't, I don't know that for certain, but it has happened at Kansas before. So. Well, I, I think probably the only other – potential upside or bright spot is if it does get out of hand the young guys the backups which you know you are limited with your travel roster but uh there there will still be a lot of players going mm -hmm. on this trip that haven't played a whole ton this year could get into that game uh, but again we'll see whether it gets lopsided quick or whether nebraska can kind of prolong that stay competitive um, but easier said than done especially when you see uh Michigan put up, what, 400 yards rushing on, on Penn State earlier this year. And, I mean, that's a top 15, top 10 national team right there, not a, a team that's at the bottom of the Big Ten like Nebraska. So Yeah. I want it to be a good game. I do. But I don't think it's going to be one. Yep. We're, we're not too optimistic. but Hey, if I'm wrong, I would love to be wrong. Please prove me wrong, Nebraska. But I don't, I don't, think, uh, I don't think I'm wrong this week. Yep. I mean, just to... Maybe my score prediction might be a little off. I hope it's wrong. I hope it's off. I don't want to cover a game like that. <laughs> but I'm just trying to make an informed guess. Yep. Well, that, that makes two of us. So we'll see how it shakes out. We will be there in Ann Arbor. Uh, again, 2.30 Central kick here. That'll be 3.30 local time up at mm -hmm. the big house. Um, game on ABC once again. So national audience will get to see this one. And we'll see how well the Huskers can hang in there against the... A national championship hopeful, a uh, conference contender, one of those top teams in the whole entire nation. Uh, Going to be a very tough challenge for this team. Test their belief, their resolve, and, of course, obviously their, their ability to execute out there on the field. So we'll see how it shakes out. But appreciate all of you tuning mm -hmm. into this one, hearing about that, uh, that Minnesota game, hearing a little bit about uh, signing day, the basketball season now underway. We'll look forward to riding with the Bows basketball teams as we continue throughout the year. But... I think that'll do it for today's episode. Again, appreciate all of you tuning in. Uh, for Amy Just, I've been Luke Mullen. Thanks for watching the Life in the Red podcast.